afternoon from Berlin, where it snowed today, and good morning uh, to those of you who um, listen and uh, from uh, in the United States. So um, today we talk about um, European power uh, or what's left of it. Um, I'm your moderator. My name is Jana Poljerin. And um, I'm thrilled to be joined by an excellent panel to discuss this question. Uh, I'll introduce my panelists briefly. Um, I have uh, Anu Bradford with me. She is a professor of law and international organization at Columbia uh, Law University. I have David McAllister, um, who is the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the European Parliament. I have Luke von Middelaar, who is a professor at the University of Leiden and one of the leading experts on the EU in Europe. And another leading expert, Natalie Tocci. She is not only the director of uh, YAI, um, a think tank working on foreign policy in Italy, but also a special advisor to Giuseppe Borrell, uh, the high representative of the European Union. Um, I think this is a very timely topic. Um, Mr. Borrell's visit in Moscow has made headlines. Um, also, um, the visit of uh, Charles Michel and Ursula von der Leyen um, uh, when they visited President Erdogan and Sofagate happened. And listening um, to Mr. Borrell in Moscow and watching um, uh, Charles Michel and Ursula von der Leyen, one as a bystander could get the impression that the EU um, is a rather toothless tiger uh, nowadays and can be pushed around by other players. Uh, it has hardly played any role in global conflicts in Syria and Belarus and Nagorno-Karabakh. So I'm asking uh, my panel here, um, is the EU still powerful? And if so, what is your favorite EU superpower? And I start with Anu. Thank you, Jana. Hello, everyone. So I think we need to acknowledge that power comes in many forms, and it depends on which dimension of power we talk about, whether you can characterize the EU as powerful or not. So if I need to pick the EU superpower, I do pick the EU's ability to regulate the world. So this is something that I have described as the Brussels effect. So the European Union is one of the largest and wealthiest consumer markets in the world. And there are very few global companies that can afford not to trade in the EU. So in order to have access to the EU market, these companies need to obey the European rules, but often, they decide that it's in their interest to apply the European rule across their global conduct or global production. So this is the mechanism, the market forces, the self-interest of global companies that have really allowed the EU to transpose its rules across the world. So one question is then whether this kind of regulatory power matters. Does it really matter that companies like Facebook and Google have adopted the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, as their global privacy policy. That companies like YouTube remove some speech as hate speech when that is defined as such by the European Union. We have examples across the environmental uh, space, how the European, Union's, uh, European Union is shaping the environmental practices of global companies. So the list could go on and on. We also see examples of the governments around the world looking to the EU and drafting their own regulations using the EU laws as a template. So this is, in my view, real power and real influence because it is something that each of us in this call and beyond feel every day. The European regulations affect the food we eat, the air we breathe, and the products we produce and consume. So in that sense, I would not only call it power, I would call it superpower. <laughs> Thank you, Anu. David, is that also the superpower you would choose? Well, I thoroughly enjoyed just uh, hearing what Ms. Bradford had to say. I would like to underline a lot. I would say, in addition to what Ms. Bradford has presented, we Europeans should be proud that over the past 71 years now, we have moved away from the qualification of being an economic power, but a political dwarf, to an even stronger global economic power on the one hand, with all the potential we have, as just described. But at an international stage, we are also a respected partner of choice for allies across the globe. We are a firm defender of multilateralism. We are the number one donor in the world 
for humanitarian aid and a reliable mediator in conflict resolution. So some may call us a soft power and indeed we are because we're not assertive enough in the military and defense field, yes, but I don't believe this is a sign of weakness because on the contrary, we have proven time over time that we have unique tools using to project power, such as the defense of democracy and human rights, the projection of our values, conflict mediation, and many, many other issues. And now we have to move on under the geopolitical commission of Ursula von der Leyen, adding to all the soft power we have, some hard power, and this means to get serious on common foreign security and defense policy in the European Union. So we have regulatory superpower, diplomatic superpower. Luke, what's your pick? Thank you, uh, Jana. Thanks to uh, all the others for, for joining. I would focus on, on something else, picking up uh, your idea, Jana, of the EU being a, uh, a, a toothless tiger. I would rather say that the EU does have teeth but the problem is that it's afraid to use its own power. And the geopolitical uh, transformation people are talking about these days is about the EU being more willing to use its strength. And that is a real change. If you think back like David McAllister just did at the founding days of the European Union 70 years ago, it was all about escaping a world of power, a world of conflicts, uh, territorial conflicts, borders, etc and bringing about a new order, first within Europe, you know, tearing down borders. And this was also seen, let's say, as a precursor, as a kind of avant-garde of a global multilateral order or even of, of world peace, where Europeans were a beacon or thought of themselves that way. But I think, uh, notwithstanding what has, just, what has just been said by Anu and, and, and David, some of that dream has fallen apart in, in previous years because of the Trump years uh, and because of the rise of, of, of Chinese power. So the idea that Europe is presenting a new normative power, soft power, etc., uh, was only possible in a way thanks to the underpinning of the European integration project by hard power, by US hard power. And that division of labor is no longer, and, and I'm, I'm happy to be able to say this at the EU-US forum, that division of labor is no longer entirely uh, convincing, convincing and, 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 and persuasive uh, for the Europeans. And that's why this topic of power is, uh, is really at the heart of, of, of current reflection. And it will be, but uh, on uh, the superpower is, is about, starts with the will to use the power which we have. Thank you. I think we come to many of these aspects uh, later. So, we, but we have the regulatory power, the diplomatic power, the let's call it geopolitical power in the making. Um, and now I'm curious what Natalie sees as kind of the EU's biggest power, actually. I would say, Jana, yeah, no, um, the EU is a resilient superpower. Uh, so I think resilience, and, and by this I mean the, the ability to change. Um, is really what constitutes European power. Um, and I say this because I connect it to the point that you started off with, the toothless tiger. Uh, and I think it's kind of worth asking ourselves, why is it that all of a sudden we've realized now that we are a toothless tiger? Well, the reason is that we used to uh, be a tiger that had teeth, um, but the way we exerted that power, that influence, uh, through conditionality, through socialization processes, be it through development, through trade, through enlargement policy, through the neighborhood policies. Um, basically, that doesn't seem to work anymore. And it doesn't seem to work anymore for the simple reason that, uh, and this connects to a point that Luke was making, the, the, the world has changed. Uh, and we, we are no longer exercising that power within the contours of the so-called international liberal order in which kind of everyone, well, either we thought or it really was the case that everyone wanted to kind of sort of look more like us and all we had to do was nudge them along uh, the way. So that world is gone and, and, you know, as European Union, we kind of went through and we are going through in some respects, 
more or less kind of, you know, 15 odd years of crisis after crisis, both internally and of course externally as well. Uh, be it the Eurozone crisis, the migration crisis, uh, now the pandemic crisis. And, and here I come to resilience. Uh, having gone through several of these crises that everyone thought, hey, they're going to collapse, you know, this is going to be the crisis to, you know, one crisis too many, it hasn't quite happened. Uh, and to an extent, particularly over the course of this third crisis, or well, in fact, one can look at the constitutional uh, uh, treaty crisis as being the first, so maybe fourth crisis, um, in a sense, we are rediscovering the sense of solidarity, not because we love one another, not out of a sense of altruism, but out of a, a, a sort of understanding or a re-understanding of what our interests are. So in a sense, there's a greater understanding that we are a community of faith than there was only a few years ago. And of course, it doesn't mean to say that it's, you know, that's it and it's a done deal. There's still a lot of work to be done. You know, I think sort of, you know, going back to going to a point that, that Anna was, was making, I think that to continue being that regulatory power, uh, we cannot simply be good at making rules, but we have to become increasingly good at innovation, at working on our internal fragmentations. Uh, because it's not going to be good enough to be a big market, you know, we have to be good as much on the, if you like, supply side as, as the demand side, so to speak. So there is work to be done, but I think that uh, now we are in a moment in which, as I said, having gone through crises that the rest of the world looked at us and says, and, and sort of thought, here they are on the verge of collapse, it hasn't happened, and it hasn't happened because at the end of the day, we have, as a European project, demonstrated a degree of resilience, if you like, that uh, probably no one really had much trust in. Thank you. So we have a uh, diplomatic superpower, we can set uh, rules and standards, we are resilient, and we are a ge geopolitical power in the making. I'm somewhat glad that none of you has mentioned um, the military uh, superpower that the EU has been developing uh, since 2016. Uh, the European Commission usually um, says that we have done uh, so much more in the previous kind of four years than in the 40 years uh, before that. So, but none of you, um, made this argument. Um, but nevertheless, Luke was talking about uh, work share. Um, so uh, coming back to the tiger, is it um, and, and traditional um, kind of means of power? How likely do you think um, that the EU will be able to, yeah, to grow teeth after all? And I start with uh, David uh, and his assessment of, of yeah, the teeth. Well, in these days, you cannot discuss this kind of issue without mentioning the buzzword of strategic autonomy, or the word I would prefer to use is European strategic sovereignty. But we know what this means. In the end, it's about Europe being ready to undertake our global responsibilities, to defend our political positions and interests, and to act in line with our values without turning our back on our allies and partners. And the European Union was created as an economic project. And what we have seen since 2016, that we've probably made more steps towards a real common European security and defense policy, more steps towards a European defense union than in 55, 60, 65 years before. And uh, this all started under Federico Mocherini as our high representative and vice president. So we now have a few cornerstones, the structured corporation, the permanent structured corporation, PESCO, the European Defense Fund, and the coordinated annual reviews on defense. But all these activities we are developing within the framework of the European Union, this is very important to underline, to our American partners and friends. For me, this is absolutely clear, is not about doing anything in competition with NATO or against NATO or duplicating NATO efforts. It's about strengthening the European pillar within NATO because we are fully aware that the alliance with the United States and Canada and the United Kingdom was crucial for our security and defense in Europe. So we want to become more European. That's what we have to do in the next years but we need to remain transatlantic. And 
Because action speaks more than words, I was happy to see yesterday that the United States, Canada and Norway were allowed to join one of the most important projects of the permanent structured cooperation, the military mobility. This is for me a good example how you can strengthen the transatlantic bond and also strengthen EU-NATO cooperation. Thank you. But nevertheless, um, I go to Natalie again with that question because Natalie was very much involved in building this new uh, architecture, defense architecture. And Natalie, my rather maybe provocative question is, does a PESCO project really um, kind of change the calculus that uh, a competitor um, has looking at the EU. So does it really make a difference or is it just a kind of nice institutions uh, on, on nice projects on, I don't know, a, a diving school uh, in Greece somewhere? I would say, Anna, to that question, it, it could, but it doesn't. And it could, but, but it doesn't because um, five years on now, it's simply not good enough anymore to say, you know, we're building the building blocks and we have a fund and we have permanent structured cooperation and we have, it, it, it's, the point is that we are surrounded by crises and we're surrounded by crises in which as European Union, regardless of whether we use PESCO or no PESCO or battle groups or no battle groups or whatever, uh, the point is that as Europeans, we do nothing. And this, at the end of the day, is what makes the difference. Yes, you know, we're all, and obviously I've worked on this myself, I work on this myself, you know, as, as many as many of, of you as well, um, but it's not good enough to build mechanisms and write papers and, 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 and take decisions on instruments. Huh? You need to, taking responsibility means taking risk. And, and this is where we fail miserably, frankly speaking, as Europeans. And I don't see much progress going on. Uh, and it's not, it's the divisions between member states. We are unfortunately terribly united in our passivity in all of these crises. And unless we start seeing some of this happening, we can build all the mechanisms and instruments, but no one is going to take us seriously, not even we do. Thank you for pouring a little uh, water into the wine, but leaving uh, the military sphere. Natalie, uh, we are now starting to building the projects you designed. <laughs> Let's use them, that's my point. Let's use them. <laughs> Maybe we kind of stop the kind of um, military um, perspective right now and look into uh, another field that Anu mentioned in the beginning and uh, maybe uh, challenging this regulatory superpower aspect a, a little bit. Um, because Natalie has just mentioned um, that in order to be a regulatory power, you also um, need to have, uh, for example, new technology in order to set standards for, for, for new technologies. You have to be able to also kind of produce them, invent them, make them. Do you think that the EU is still a front runner in this regard? So I, I absolutely wanted to build on the comment that Natalie made because I think it's, it's a key. We cannot be content just to be the regulator of the new technologies. The EU cannot just be the referee it needs to get on the field, play the game, play offense and play defense and play well. And I think we can do that because in many ways, the regulatory power that the EU has should give it the confidence that it can set the rules for that game to the extent that the game is not tilted against the European success. And there are additional instruments that we have been deploying. For instance, we talked about the digital tax. Now see very positive uh, uh, developments with more assertive diplomacy, potentially getting the United States and the world on board to create a more level playing field. We just had the new uh, regulatory proposal unveiled on controlling better foreign subsidies that can distort the marketplace. So yes, we do need to worry that the level play, uh, playing field is there, but that is not the only thing. We also need to invest decisively in building these new technologies. We need to build in the human capabilities, which also includes not relying only on European talent. We need to become the magnet for the world talent. That is one of the recipes of American technological leadership. And I want Europe to follow that path. We need to complete our capital markets union so that we can fund those European innovations. So there is a list and I want us to be distinctly ambitious about that list. 
And I would like to think that the new AI regulation, for instance, tries to chart that path forward. We understand that we need to invest and embrace these technologies. The AI is an opportunity, it is not a threat. But we also assert our values in what is the kind of AI future that we want to lead. So in many ways, there doesn't need to be a trade-off between innovation and regulation. There can be regulation that is enabling of innovation combined with other reforms that are needed for that European leadership. Thank you, Anu. Coming back to what you have said, Luke, uh, the geopolitical power in the making. So how do you assess the work of von der Leyen's so-called geopolitical commission so far? Has she been successful uh, in your eyes? And what do you think what prevents the European Union from becoming more geopolitical? Well, I think uh, she was right in, in pointing to that term, but I have some doubts in ascribing this quality of geopolitical to the European Commission as an institution. For me, it is a much larger transformation, which is about the European Union as a whole, which should be become more uh, ge geopolitical and with the Commission at the service of that idea. And that goes back to the discussion we just had also on the, even on matters of, of defense. Because sometimes there's a misunderstanding of thinking that Europe is completely identified with the EU, with EU actors, with EU representatives. And especially in defense, as we just noticed, then it all uh, still is and remains uh, in the domain, let's say, of projects and, and declarations. But at the same time, the European Union is a union of 27 states, member states, some of which do dispose of a very strong military marine. So let me, let me take one concrete example to, to see how this plays out. Last year, there was a um, last summer and, and, and last autumn, there were skirmishes in the Mediterranean between Turkey and two EU member states, Greece and Cyprus. Uh, Turkey exploring territorial water, waters, a bit intimidating. It, 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 was, it was a bit robust and, and, and nasty. Well, the EU as such could do not much. But France, President of France, Macron said, well, hey, listen, these are EU fellow member states. Their territory is in a way threatened. I'm going to send out the Marine. So he sent the French naval ship. And this is not an EU flag on that naval ship, but it was a European EU mission in a way, in a broader sense, which did show some classic uh, hard power, and uh, which was one reason <clears throat> uh, President Erdogan of Turkey uh, backed off, among, among other reasons, uh, obviously. So this is just to say that, for me, it's key to frame this idea of geopolitical, uh, a geopolitical European Union in the context of our interaction between the EU institutions, between Brussels and the national capitals, and first and foremost, those who have uh, disposed of, of military power in this respect. And the same is true for the other fields of, of action. Because if we only look at the EU institutions to carry the weight of projecting hard power, I'm afraid we will look a long time. So it's urgent to create that interaction, interplay at all levels, uh, of uh, political decision making and of preparation uh, to for Europe as a whole and union as a whole to project that geopolitical power. I take um, your point and uh, give it to David McAllister, who basically in our panel here represents uh, a European institution, the European Parliament. Um, so um, my question to you is, how do you react to what um, Luke has just said? How well do you think kind of the EU institutions are connected to member states or so this Brussels level uh, and the national level? Is that working well? And maybe another uh, short um, question, kind of looking at SOFA gate, one of the problems seems to be that uh, there are two many people around who uh, want to represent the EU um, kind of in foreign policy. Do you think there is also a problem that you have just too many people uh, wanting to have a say? Well, on SofaGate, I think this issue has been discussed thoroughly enough uh, for many weeks, including a plenary debate in the European Parliament. Uh, we are, we've been very clear as European Parliament that this shall never happen again. And this needs to be sorted out between the team of the President of the European Council and the team of the Commission President. And I think the President of the European Council knows that they, 
there's still room for improvement when it comes to their protocol work. I think this was very unfortunate what happened in Ankara, but I would prefer to talk about EU-Turkey relations in substance. But I think I've been clear here where the difficulties were, and the Turkish foreign minister also yesterday, or was it today in a German newspaper interview, always said it was not the Turkish protocol who was responsible for this mess, but uh, the European uh, Council president's team. Now, what we've heard, I think that's a legitimate criticism. Yes, being a geopolitical commission is a big word. You won't reach this from one day to the other. This is a longer process. I think what is important is if we want to strengthen the EU's common foreign and security policy, we also need a more coherent approach, first of all, within the Brussels institutions. Uh, we need to fine tune not only our foreign policy, but also our security and defense policy, our international trade policy, our development policy, our enlargement policy, and our neighborhood policy. So that is a big, big challenge and responsible for this is the high representative and vice president, uh, Josep Borrell. That's for one point. But the second point is, as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, I am entitled to take part in the informal meetings of EU foreign ministers. And I witness this two or three times a year when 27 foreign ministers sit around the table. On Sundays, they all agree in their speeches that we need a more united, a more assertive, a more a stronger European foreign policy. But they don't always remember what they said on Sundays when they sit around the table on Mondays. So what we have to do to become a more serious geopolitical player is also to improve the decision making processes within the member states in order to act more swiftly, to become more ambitious and to allow the European Union actually to move beyond the current state of play. But this in the end lies in the hands of the 27 member states. The high representative can only react and act if the 27 member states are capable of speaking with one voice, singing from one hymn sheet, as the English say, and actually give him more responsibility. I saw uh, Natalie nodding vigorously. Um, so Natalie, um, what, what is your take on kind of the interaction between member states and the EU institutions? It's, and how can we as David McAllis has just um, said, how can we achieve that the EU is speaking with one voice really? And how can we kind of convince member states to give up uh, more power and, and to, to delegate it to Brussels? Is that at all possible? Well, I mean, you know, I think that um, to, 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 I think there are different ways in which this can be done. Huh? I mean, you know, there is the question of decision making, which obviously then gets us into the whole debate over qualified majority voting and, and how to achieve that. Uh, and given that uh, European integration is by definition a process, it will probably not be achieved as a one shot game, uh, but it can be achieved in, in a sense precisely in the way in which uh, the Commission President has, has outlined. Yeah? So you start with uh, issues like uh, human rights, uh, passing through, uh, you know, sort of a notch up going to sanctions, uh, and then also considering that when it comes to approving uh, a, a European a CSDP a mission or operation, uh, you do not uh, veto if you do not intend participating. Uh, it's all very well that not everyone has to do everything, but at, but at least if you not, don't intend participating, don't prevent others from, from doing so. So I think, you know, one can outline, if you like, a process of that kind. One can also imagine uh, measures that can be taken to, uh, in a sense, responsibilize and empower member states to act in the name of the European Union. So, you know, the idea of looking at contact groups in connection with European institutions, provided that the contact groups do not always include the same member states, but having different configurations for different conflicts or crises or issues that you want to tackle, uh, creating that institutional link with the EU institutions so those that are not uh, included do not feel excluded, uh, but, but empowering, the, empowering the member states to act in the name of the European Union, because David is absolutely right. You, you know, member states, foreign ministers enter a meeting, they sign off on council conclusions, they walk out and they forget the minute they walk out of that door. <laughs> Huge agreement here. Um, 
I would like uh, for one minute to come back to Anu because um, I'm, I'm still drawing on your argument, the regulatory superpower, Anu, and um, kind of bringing the big power competition to our discussion about European power. I'm wondering whether kind of that regulatory power doesn't depend on the uh, Globalization on open markets and on uh, yeah and on open trade. So with uh, the growing competition between the U.S. and China, we see also some tendencies of decoupling and maybe a competition who sets the standards. But how likely or, or, or how resistant um, or resilient, as Natalie said in the beginning, is the EU in its regulatory power vis-à-vis -vis this uh, great power competition and also this changing view uh, on, on globalization? So you're absolutely right that uh, regulatory power depends on globalization. It is the dynamics of the global markets that persuade the companies to pursue uniformity and opt for European standards globally. But we cannot be complacent because China is constantly increasing its regulatory capabilities. And we see it being especially assertive when it comes to digital economy exporting its standards through building infrastructure, telecommunications, e-commerce infrastructure across the world, and exporting its digital authoritarian standards in the process. So this is an example where the EU needs to continue to regulate not just unilaterally, but also reach out to like-minded countries, the techno-democracies, uh, the United States, where we see very much eye to eye in thinking about the threat posed by Chinese standard setting. Work more in international organizations like the International Telecommunications Union or ICANN, where the US and the EU have dropped the ball and let the Chinese take on a very active role in standard setting. So I don't think the European standard setting needs to come to an end because of the great power competition, but the EU needs to be particularly conscious in seeing how countries like China are increasingly stepping ahead and, and upping their game as well. And the digital economy, that's where I would say that this is the battle of standards, is the battle of the values, where we talk about the future of liberal democracy and individual freedom, and where we really can't afford to lose that fight. Thank you. So we have two minutes. So one very last question. Speaking about homework, which power um, capability does the EU need to develop most urgently? And you just have basically two sentences to answer this question. I start with Luke. Well, then I'll pick up on where Anu just uh, left off, which is the power of digital innovation. Because it's great how the global regulatory power, for instance, in data protection. Huh? But as we uh, when we do not have data to mine in the first place, because all these data are either with the authoritarian Chinese government or with American Silicon uh, Valley uh, companies, uh, then we, we, we are missing a, a step there. So this is about innovation, about protection jobs for the future. And there I think I need to stop you here because I want to hear it from the others as well. And we are running out of time. So David, very briefly, your, your homework power most important power would be the power to power of unity. The official motto of the European Union is united in diversity. I haven't read anything about being blocked in squabbles. So if we <laughs> really want to become a serious global actor, it's so crucial that we show more unity among the 27 EU member states. Thank you, Natalie, very briefly. Well, I mean, clearly, obviously, on the one hand, defense capabilities, I'm not going to go through the list there. I think we all know what we're talking about. Uh, digital innovation, I guess I was going to talk about that, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that. I would add to this uh, on the energy front. Uh, I think that what we also need to do, given that we're talking about uh, green deal, green transition, uh, is thinking about what kind of green capabilities we need to have in order not uh, to, uh, if you like, consign ourselves uh, sort of uh, key, keys in hand to the Chinese. Okay, Anu, um, we're out of time. But I got to say my word already. I cast my vote for the digital power and innovation. Okay, so thank you very much and back to the studio.